Hey everyone, welcome to Singularity Beast 2, Build Log Part 17. At the end of the last video, I changed the coolant to Mayhem's X1 UV Blue. And I mentioned that this coolant color is to go with something that I'm getting airbrushed onto the side panel. I'm still in the process of organizing that. That's something that you'll see coming up soon. In this video, I'm going to install the hot swap base. I'm going to swap the AX1200 for the AX1200i and temporarily redo the cable management yet again. I'm going to install part of the lighting and I also have a massive surprise for you. So I'm now going to get started with a look at the hot swap bays that I've chosen for this build. Okay, when choosing these hot swap bays, brands didn't matter to me. All I was looking for was a quad 3.5 inch and a quad 2.5 inch. I wanted them to be all black, have an overall clean aesthetic to match up with the build. SATA 3, preferably trailers because it's a lot more convenient. Decent quality, of course, and I also wanted them to be silent. So either no fans or the ability to switch the fans on and off or at least high or low. So what I ended up with is a an iStar USA BPNDE series, quad 3.5 inch, it fits into three 5.25 inch bays, and an IC dot quad 2.5 inch that fits into a single 5.25 inch bay. So I'm really happy with the aesthetics of both. The BPN DE series is brushed aluminium all over and it looks like it has a good clear coat over the top of it. You can see the silver accents in the front. I think that's going to look great in the front of the build. That's actually ventilation through the front there. It's trailless, it's lockable, it has activity LEDs down the right hand side there. It's actually upside down at the moment. You can see the back plane in there. And looking at the back, it does have an 80 millimeter fan, which is not so good. I would have preferred a 120 millimeter fan, but I can still replace this for something more silent. It does have a high low switch, but I have tested it and it's still a little bit loud. It also has a on off switch over there for the activity LEDs and you can see two SATA power connectors and four SATA data connectors. And it's also SATA 3. I'm just going to give you the model numbers of both of these. So the model number for the IC dock and the model number for the iStar USA, just in case you're interested. So now for a look at the IC dock quad 2.5 inch. So this is also SATA 3. It's designed for SSDs and hard drives. It has activity lights in the front, plenty of ventilation in the front, as you can see. It's not trailers but that's not really a problem, just four bolts to install the drive. They actually slide in from the side of the caddy. It has a black powder coat all over, and I'm pretty sure this is steel, whereas the, the iStar USA is all aluminium and plastic. Just a quick look at the inside, and now looking from around the back. So you can see it has two 50 millimeter fans, and these are probably going to be fairly loud and annoying. The good thing is there's an on off switch and because I'm running SSDs, I'm just going to leave the fans off 24 seven, single Molex for power and for SATA data. It's now time to swap over the power supply to the AX1200i. Unfortunately, I can't use the cables from the AX1200. So I'm going to have to redo the cable management completely. And there's a lot of work in that. This is temporary cable management. I've done temporary cable management previously before this. And I'm now going to be doing it again because what I'm going to do, I, I can't have any downtime. So I'm going to use the kit, the cable kit that came with the AX1200i temporarily. And I'm going to get another kit of cables and I'm going to sleeve those. And once I finish the sleeving, I'll install those cables and do the final cable management. I have a number of custom cables that I'm going to make up for this build as well. So I want the cable management in this build to be as clean as possible. So I'm going to get started on removing all of these cables and the power supply. I've, I'm doing a separate review on the AX1200i. So I'm not going to give you any details on the power supply in this video. I've now finished swapping over the power supplies and also all of the cables. And I actually tried the cables from the AX1200 in the AX1200i. And the only one that fits is the 24 pin motherboard power. So now I have the default cables installed from the AX1200i. None of them are individually sleeved. So it's going to look terrible. Good thing this is only temporary cable management. And that's actually why I didn't show you any of the process 
of doing the cable management. It's only temporary. I will take you through the entire process when I do the final cable management and I'll be able to, you know, do an advanced guide on cable management. I'm also going to, you know, customize all the cables, sleeve them, and not just the power supply cables, but I'm going to make up custom cables for the the hot swap bays and the hard drive cages and the fans everything you know it's going to be incredibly clean I'm looking forward to perfecting the aesthetics around the back of the build you know as well as around the front of the build now the AX 1200i is an awesome power supply remember I'm dropping down from two AX 1200s in this build to a single AX 1200i and the benefits I was after was mainly silence because this has a far more silent fan curve than the AX 1200 the fan doesn't even kick in until the power supply reaches 30% of load. And I've built this entire system for silence. I have silent fans. I've set up the Aquero to spin the fans right down to nothing at idle. Also the efficiency, because I run this build almost 24 seven and it uses a lot of power and it adds up quickly. As well as that, this power supply supplies clean up power and I'm planning on doing a lot of overclocking so this could potentially help with my overclocks. Now another awesome feature of this power supply is Corsair Link and I cover this in detail in my review. It allows you to monitor every aspect of the power supply. Temperature, fan RPM, efficiency, the load on the power supply, the load on the rails. You can actually switch from a single rail to multiple rails. It's incredible. Okay, the hot swap bays are now installed. And I'm happy with the way they look. It's good to have something more in this front panel. The case is so massive, it fits so much hardware and there was all these blank panels in the front of the case. So it's good to see something there. They're definitely going to come in handy as well. And I'm, I'm glad I picked these. They look good, they match up with the case nicely. Looks good on the inside too. It fills in the blank space. You know, there used to be this big blank space right through here in the build. You have to remember that the side panel window comes into here. So you're not going to see any of this anyway. You know, this is the 5.25 inch bay area. It's always, you know, in most builds it's always messy. But I think it looks pretty clean, mainly because the two hot swap bays are completely black. Anyway, they look good. I haven't connected them up yet because I'm going to connect them up when I do the final cable management in this build. And I'm going to make up custom cables for both of them because the cables are pretty much in, in view and they need to obviously be as clean as possible. Now I might actually flip this hot swap bay over so that, because here's all the connections here, it would be great if they were on the other side. So if it's possible, I will turn it upside down. You know, if I did that, it wouldn't actually look too bad from the front because there's not really any way of knowing except for these, you know, padlocks here that, that it's upside down. It's going to look cleaner from the inside if I do that. That's what's really important. So I installed it kind of in the middle between the radiator here and this fitting. You know, I could have brought it down and to the next bay but it would have almost touched the fitting I also could have brought it up one but then it would have kind of blocked the airflow so it's a good spot for it so just a quick look around the temporary cable management yes it looks terrible good thing it's only for a short time so I've put LEDs in the CPU and memory water blocks these are ModSmart 3mm white LEDs and they're all sleeved I'm actually thinking of using non-sleeved LEDs because it's added a lot of extra cable bulk and when they're not sleeved you can actually push the wiring down along the PCB of the motherboard and hide it a lot better. It can be almost completely out of sight, so I might do that. But I am really happy with the way this looks. It's great having this water block and crystal link configuration lit up because it is the heart of the build. In combination with these white LEDs, I'm going to use UV lighting around the rest of the build. I'm going to install that in the next part of the build log, so you'll see that coming up. Now in part 16 of this build log I talked about a problem that I've had with my tubing staining. I also talked about tubing clouding and leaching plasticizer so if you haven't already checked out part 16 go back and check it out for all of the details. 
Now in part 16, I didn't really confidently confirm what was causing this problem, but I did talk about the fact that I had run Feather Red UV coolant in some of these components for over six months, including the radiators. And if you think about it, it's fairly obvious. All of the other components in this loop are transparent, and I can see that they're not stained. Obviously, the staining must be in the radiators. The, the copper on the inside of the radiators must be porous enough to you know, hold dye. I'm not talking about the dye building up in the radiators and clogging them. I'm talking about it soaking into the, the material in the radiators over a long period of time. You know, six months is more than enough time. And now it is slowly leaching out again. And you know, it's only staining the tubing because the tubing is the softest, the least dense material in the loop. So what I'm going to do is take you through the process of fixing this problem. Usually, from my experience, flushing the loop with distilled water is more than enough to remove staining. I'm not talking about a quick flush, I'm talking about running distilled water for a few days, but I've done that a number of times with this loop. I've changed coolants, I've changed tubing, and still the staining is hanging around. So when you get staining that's difficult to remove, there's a number of products you can use. Vinegar, isopropyl alcohol, and bleach is a few that I've heard of. So I'm going to try one of these, I'm not sure which one yet. I'm not going to run it through the entire loop, I'm only going to run it through the radiators and hopefully it will fix this problem. I'll take you through the entire process and hopefully I can put some good information out there about removing staining. So I'm going to cover that in the next part of the build log. Now remember what all of this is about, the entire purpose of my videos is bringing to you information. So. With my own systems, I'm constantly testing and experimenting, and that's what this process has been. It's just another opportunity to bring to you some more information. Singularity Beast 2 is at last getting a graphics upgrade. I'm replacing the GTX 580 3GB editions with a couple of MSI GTX 680 Lightnings. And these things are incredible. They have a custom designed PCB specifically for overclocking. The power delivery components have been beefed up. They have a 12 phase digital power design. And you can see how much wider the PCB is to fit all of these extra power delivery components. So it steps up just there where the, the SLI connectors are. And then again, it's, the PCB is actually as wide as the cooler is. This is the MSI Twin Froza 4 cooler, which is going to be getting removed and replaced with some EK water blocks, of course. It has two 8-pin PCI Express power connectors, plenty of overclocking features. The best thing about it is that all of the overclocking restrictions of the GTX 680, you know, which are absolutely hated. I can't believe that Nvidia did that. All of them have been removed. So it actually has an LN2 BIOS that allows voltage increase on the GPU, the memory, and the PLL. It also has temp sensors and voltage read points for the GPU, memory, and PLL. You can see it has a backplate, and on, on the back of the graphics card is something called GPU Reactor. It's an extra PCB underneath that little cover that increases capacitance by 200%. Now, I could go on about these all day, but I'm actually doing a separate review. So if you want all the details, check out the review. Now, I knew this graphics upgrade wasn't going to mean much of a performance increase. I mean, that still remains to be seen in the results. But what was more important to me was choosing a graphics card that I could overclock, that was designed for overclocking. Also, the massive increase in efficiency. Now on top of that, these graphics cards put out less heat than GTX 580s, and I have one less graphics card. So that's going to mean less load on my water cooling system, which is going to give me a lot more overclocking headroom. I've removed the GTX 580s and I've installed the GTX 680s. And you can see a little bit of staining in these water blocks. The blue is actually blue coolant still in the water blocks. I haven't even flushed them out yet. Okay, I've set up the bypass in the loop. And this system is looking seriously ugly at the moment. Tubing everywhere, messy temporary cable management, and air-cooled graphics cards. It reminds me of how much there still is to do on this system, which is great. It means a lot more videos in this build log. So 
I'm actually only running this loop bypass and the air cooled graphics cards for the review that I'm doing on these graphics cards. Once I have all the results that I need, it should only take me a day to get them. I'll remove the graphics cards again, put the water blocks on them, reinstall them, and then hook up the loop properly again. And I actually have some plans for the loop. Like I'm going to take the opportunity to replace all of the bad tubing, to flush out the loop, fix the problem with the die, and I'm going to make some little changes and tweaks to the loop as well, which I'm pretty excited about. But that's all going to be in the next part of the build log. Now you might have noticed that I'm actually booting the system at the same time as I'm filling it. And the only reason I'm doing things this way is because the loop was already three quarters full. And also because I've already leak tested this system except for the two connections that I had to undo. Now if I, if I ever end up doing things like this, I take the system into the BIOS and I watch the temperatures in the BIOS but you know when idling it's never a problem. Problems can arise when doing this if you don't have enough coolant flowing through the water blocks the system will heat up really fast. So here it is all up and running my temporary review setup for the MSI GTX 680 Lightning graphics cards and actually the EK water blocks arrived earlier so I'm going to give you a look at those shortly. So you can see I've completely bypassed the graphics cards with this loop from the motherboard water block down to the pumps. And that replaces all of the Bits Power Crystal Link that I had in there before. And I'm actually going to use Bits Power Crystal Link again, even though I'm using EKCSQ water blocks. It will mean that I need to use a lot of 90 degree fittings. You'll see that in the next part of the build log. I can tell you these graphics cards even look awesome in here despite the fact that they're air cooled and what I love the most about these EK water blocks is that they work with the stock backplates and the GPU reactor so the backs of these graphics cards are going to stay the same even when I install the water blocks I'm so happy about that because they they match up with the build so well you know the the blue LEDs go with the color scheme and the theme of this build perfectly you can see the GPU reactor on both of the graphics cards has blue LEDs in it. The fans also have blue LEDs. They're obviously going to be removed though. And there's also a number of LEDs on the back of the PCB. These three I think show the voltage levels of the GPU memory and PLL and there's 12 next to that that show the activity of the power phases so they light up depending on the load of the graphics card. Now I'm going to cover some comparative performance results between the Tri-SLI GTX 583 Gigabyte configuration and the SLI GTX 680 MSI Lightning Editions. Now all of those results were taken at 1920 by 1080 the default settings on all of the benchmarks. And some interesting results there, despite the fact that I'm down one graphics card and also down one gig of memory per graphics card, the results were very close and sometimes the 680s were ahead. So that's to give you an idea of the performance difference between the 580s and 680s at 1920 by 1080 Now for some game results at 5760 by 1080 now all of these games were at maximum settings and I do a 60 second time trial in heavy action in each game. So for Borderlands 2 the average frame rate was 73 for the 580s and 69 for the 680s so a slight decrease. For Crisis 2 and by the way I'm running the, the high resolution texture pack and all of that in Crisis 2 the average frame rate was 44 for the 580s and 40 for the 680s, so again a slight decrease. Max Payne 3, 49 for the 580s, 53 for the 680s, so that's a slight increase. Batman Arkham City, 55 for the 580s, 56 for the 680s, so almost exactly the same result. Battlefield 3, 74 for the 580s and 88 for the 680s, so that's where you see the biggest increase. So remember 
those results were all at 5760 by 1080 maximum settings. So again, some incredibly close results there. They could almost be within margin of error, except for 3D Mark 11 and Battlefield 3 where the GTX 680s pulled ahead. Now, some of you might be wondering, why didn't I get 4GB GTX 680s? Because it's true, I would see a benefit from the extra memory because I run everything at 5760 by 1080 I have a triple screen configuration. Well, the reason is because the memory will limit my overclocks. You know, the more memory you have on a graphics card, the, the more problems you run into when overclocking, the more limitations. I have found this out with my GTX 583 gigabyte editions. Compared to 1.5 gig GTX 580s, I couldn't overclock them. You know, it was terrible. So this time around, I wanted something I could push the limits. And that is when you're seriously going to see the headroom out of these graphics cards. They are going to pull well ahead of my GTX 580 config once I start to overclock them. And I will have those results coming up in the next part of the build log. We'll see what these things can do. Now moving on to a look at the EK water blocks I'm going to use on these graphics cards. Now this is a beautiful looking block. So far this is the only model that EK has made of this water block. They don't have their usual options of you know, nickel plexi, copper plexi, all of that. They might make different options coming up, but despite the fact that this water block doesn't match any of the other water blocks in my build, I'm really happy with it. You know, it might not match the water blocks in my build, but it matches the, the color scheme still, so, you know, the silver is going to go well with all of the other nickel in the build and also all of the bits power black sparkle fittings and there is also a lot of black in the build. I really like the CSQ design on this block. You don't really notice the circles as much on a black surface and having it, you know, kind of mirrored like this, the black circles on the silver, it just looks awesome. So I'm I'm really happy with this block. You can see it has the MSI logo in there. I think it should have lightning written on it somewhere, maybe on the silver there, like engraved. That would be awesome. It seems to be a bit thinner than I'm used to, than I remember, you know, than, than other EK blocks, but it's extremely heavy and solid. You know, EK uses a lot of high quality, expensive materials in their blocks. They certainly don't cut any corners or, or skimp anywhere. There is a lot of a lot of copper in this block. It, you know, it's really, really heavy. You can see all the contact points on the bottom there. All of those extra power delivery components require, you know, a lot more contact of the water block. So you can see this contact point here goes all the way across. The design of you know, the custom design PCB is so neat and clean, everything's lined up, and you can see that in these contact points. But anyway, another awesome looking high quality water block from EK. And I'm really happy with it. I'm very excited to see these water blocks on the graphics cards. That will be for the next part of the build log. So I'm going to start the next part of the build log with the installation of these water blocks. That sums up this video. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, like and favorite if you want to see more.